everyone, and welcome to the Path 11 podcast. I'm hoping that all of you have already pre-ordered the Path Evolution DVD, and if not, please head on over to our website, path11productions.com or thepathseries.com, to go ahead and do so. It's really going to be an awesome documentary and one that you're going to want to watch. You don't need to purchase or have watched the two before the Path Evolution, but... Um, we know that this one's going to be the best. So I hope you head on over and make that purchase today. And today we are speaking with William Martin, who is an award-winning author whose work expresses the practical wisdom and inspiration of Taoist thought for contemporary readers. He's a native of California and graduated from the University of California at Berkeley with a degree in electronic engineering. After four years working for the Navy as a research scientist, he returned to graduate school and earned a master's degree from Western Theological Seminary in Holland, Michigan. He did not find himself fitting with the Christian church clergy structure, so guided by his love of the Tao Te Ching, he began to seek his own way. He spent two decades in private practice as a marriage and family counselor in Phoenix, Arizona, and taught counseling for many years at Rio Salado College in Phoenix. He's been a student of the Tao for four decades. We'd like to welcome William to our show. Hi, Bill. How are you doing? I'm doing just fine. Thank you. And we're here to talk about your book that is out, The Activist Tao Te Ching. Am I pronouncing that right? That's right, The Activist Tao Te Ching. Okay. So I'm pretty excited to do this podcast for, um, well, one of the reasons being is that this is somewhat of new information for me. So I am probably going to ask some really basic questions. Um, Because I want to say the first time that I ever heard of Tao Te Ching was through Wayne Dyer. Um, Oh, yes. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, I want to say maybe it was a couple of years ago, I might have been listening to one of his YouTube videos, and he went on to talk about how he pretty much spent a whole year, I guess, doing somewhat maybe of what you did and retranslated the Tao in his own way, and he came up with a book called Living the Wisdom of the Tao. Um, So I would like to maybe start a little bit from the beginning of how your path kind of came to this point. Because you have yeah. a pretty interesting story. <laughs> yeah, if, if my father were alive, he'd still be waiting for me to get a real job, I think. I, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I first came in touch with the Tao Te Ching as a little book of wisdom poetry. God, it must be 50 years ago now. Um, I was working with the Navy and a uh, martial arts instructor saw that I wasn't a real good karate uh, aficionado, and he he said, you know, you'd probably like Tai Chi, which is a very smooth, flowing kind of uh, semi-martial exercise. And he started to teach me that, and he gave me a little book called the Tao Te Ching, and he said, this is, uh, Tai Chi is a physical representation of what this book says. So that was 50 years ago. And I had this little book called the Tao Te Ching, and then my my path has been very uh, varied and winding and secure, circuitous, but that little book has always stuck with me. Uh, like many people, I, I saw my life kind of as a spiritual quest, and I tried most of the usual routes for taking a spiritual quest, all of which were somewhat helpful, but none of which really deeply satisfied me. And all the while, this little book kept coming along with me, and I, it, it's where I really turned to for that really makes sense. That's that touches on the mystery of life and and uh, the flow of life and uh, yin and yang and paradox of life for me better than anything else ever has. And finally, I just kind of gave up and about 20 years ago said, "Well, this is just my path." And uh, I then I first, first the first book I wrote was called "The Parents Tao Te Ching," and it it remains my bestseller. Somehow, it kind of touched a nerve with people. Um, other than, uh, and then since then I've published about eight books on the Tao Te Ching, uh, one of which is actually my own translation, but most of which are just expressions, a little bit like Wayne Dyer. Not so much a translation as, for instance, the parents Tao Te Ching was an attempt coming out of my own struggles as a, as a single parent to, to express how might a parent find some balance and stability and, and, and contentment in the midst of a, a fairly 
difficult task. And that kind of touched a nerve. And so I've kind of been working with the Tao Te Ching ever since. And this, this book, The Activist Tao Te Ching, is probably, from my own heart, the most important one I've, I've written. It probably won't be the most popular one, but it's, it's the book I've, I've wanted to write for several years now. And I'm delighted that New World gave me a chance to do that. Yeah, now can you bring us um, back to what this ancient Chinese text is about mm-hmm. and uh, the concept of it? I've never actually picked that book up itself uh, uh-huh. to look through and to understand, so I'm curious to know more about that. Yeah, it's about 2,600 years old. It was written legendarily by a Chinese sage named Lao Tzu. And he, there was probably a person named Lao Tzu who wrote most of it, but like most ancient texts, it's you know been probably been added to and interpreted. But in, in general, it's this ancient book of wisdom. It's a very short book. It's 81 short poetic chapters. Chinese wisdom literature tended to be written in poetry. Um, the title Tao is is the word for way. It could be the path up to the front door or a path through the woods. Or it can also be that mysterious path and way by which life unfolds itself, kind of a, the mystery of life, the Tao of life. De, T-E, means natural power or natural virtue that's the virtue that's inherent in all living beings, in all living matter, really, just that natural quality. And Qing just means book. So the title actually means the book of the way of natural power or natural living. Uh, it's poetry. It was considered at the time in a, in a very strictly controlled Confucian society to be unpatriotic, anarch, anarchist, hippie, no good, good for nothing literature. It was... <laughs> Lao Tzu was, was, was not popular with the, the uh, establishment of the time, but the common people loved, loved his words, loved his teachings. So it's a book of uh, Chinese poetry, a short book, about 5,000 Chinese characters. Uh, Lao Tzu didn't want to write. <laughs> the legend is that this, this, this wonderful teacher finally got so fed up with the warring states period in China and the corruption and the materialism and the the idiocy of his government um, that he got on the back of an ox and headed for the hills. And when he got to the border, the guard stopped him and said, Master, you can't leave until you write down your wisdom. And Lao Tzu said, if I write it down, it won't be the Tao. Nevertheless, the guard said, you have to write it down before you leave. So he got off his ox, sat under the shade of a tree, and in one afternoon wrote the 5,000 characters that were the Tao Te Ching, tossed it to, his, to the guard, got on his ox, and disappeared. And so here, 2,500 years later, we have this, this little book, the Tao Te Ching. It's one of the most published books in the world one of the most translated books in the world, and yet Lao Tzu was hesitant to write it because one of his primary feelings was the more we talk about it, the less we understand it. Mm -hmm. The first chapter of his book is, the Tao that can be spoken is not the real eternal Tao. So he had this, he used words, but he had this fundamental understanding that the minute I say it, that's not it. So here I am, having spent 20 years saying it, which (laughs) he also had a couple of lines in a later chapter that said, those who speak do not know, those who know do not speak. And here, so you picture me 20 years of speaking about the Tao, you can guess how much I know. Right, and and do you think that that reference is because the Tao is really something that needs to be experienced and felt, and there really uh isn't? word or language to put to it. Exactly, yeah. And there's nothing wrong with using words or language to attempt to express it. As long as we understand that that's not really it. And we all know that. We all know that our words don't 
don't catch the experience of our life. Right. Now, with his wisdom that he wrote down, what was some of the wisdom in those 5,000 characters that he wrote? Yeah, the, the, it was, in a sense, it was very countercultural at the time and, and even now. Um, the, the, the idea that words can't do it, um, that you have to be very careful with how you speak. Another aspect of his, of his wisdom was the effortless flow of life. It was a Chinese concept called Wu Wei, which means literally means not doing, not doing, doing, but is, is in, in essence, the effortless doing of things. Culturally, he lived at a time where uh, achievement and progress were uh, among the most valuable uh, assets. He contended that achievement was an illusion and that both achievement and, and what the culture called progress were illusions and that life was best lived letting whatever naturally arises be what you do. And if nothing's naturally arising for you, then don't do anything. Just let life live itself through you. That gets caricatured a bit as, you know, kind of the old hippie go with the flow and take it easy and don't do anything. But it's not really that. It's the idea that tension and anxiety and stress um, make our actions less effective. And when we attach to outcomes and trying to get things done, things actually bottle up inside of us. He thinks that action should be natural and flowing, uh, not the kind of resistance that we have of one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake, always second-guessing, always struggling, always stressing ourselves. Uh, he also said that the use of force is counterproductive. Uh, the more you try to force something, uh, the less success you have. That that our actions should flow like water flows, and when it meets an obstacle, it it gathers its strength, and it either flows under, or it flows over, or it goes around, or it it uh, pushes through, or it evaporates and rains on the other side. But it adapts itself to its obstacles and doesn't meet it with the strong aggressive force that we tend to uh, use in our life. He also understood that life is yin and yang, the two poles, the seeming poles of existence. The yin is the, the receptive and the, you could call it passive, the, the dark, the mysterious, and yang is the, the active and kind of the assertive and the two can't be separated from each other, and that life is always a circle. You've seen a little yin-yang symbol, mm -hmm. the little two, and that was a Chinese attempt to, to, to express a, a circle in motion so that this you'd see the yin always flowing into the yang that flowed back into the yin, and things were always in this constant circular uh, process in life, and wheels within wheels within wheels, and to go against the flow of yin and yang was to make your life uh, uh, harder than it needed to be. When it was time for action, go into action with all your with all your energy. When it's time for inaction, let yourself rest and let the time for action arise naturally. Lao Tzu and we ourselves live in a society in which action doesn't naturally arise. It's it seems like it's always forced. That there's always the doing, doing, doing. And the idea of rest is even something that you're supposed to do right. Mm -hmm. And he was much more, he was much more uh, feeling that there was a natural flow to life. He also had some strong opinions about leaders. After looking at the leaders in his society, he, he felt that this was not the way of the Tao. For him, leadership should be very much a servant and very much hidden uh, that effective leadership was nothing more than a person who had the ability to understand what the common people wanted and then the ability to help them get what they wanted. 
so he didn't lead them. He followed what they wanted, and his job was to help them uh, organize or do whatever it is they needed to do so that what they really wanted, what they naturally needed for a content and happy life, they were able to get. And he understood that the leadership at his time was, was not this at all, that wealth was flowing into the cities, wealth was flowing upward into the leadership, wealth was flowing out of the 80% of people who were rural in villages and concentrating in cities. And he saw leaders as taking from people what the leaders wanted and the people as being left bereft. So <laughs> I've just kind of been babbling away here, but... Yeah, no, that's a, great. A, a lot of countercultural uh, understandings. And now, uh, go ahead. Oh yeah, no, I, that, that's really helpful to have the background. And but one of my questions too, and it, it may tie into this with the way that you're talking about the way that he sees leaders and kind of his approach and how he believed life in some way should be lived. Is that what you mean when you reference him as a quietist? Yes. Uh huh. Uh huh that he, he, he is caricatured even as a quietist. Uh, sometimes that's the official kind of academic description of his take on Taoism. It's called quietist Taoism. Uh, there's a Taoism in China that's very religious with all the bells and whistles of religions and gods and rituals and temples. But Lao Tzu's Taoism was quite separate from that, and it goes under the category of, of quietist Taoism. It was more of a philosophy than a religion. And it gets, and it's that sense that any action has to arise out of a quiet center. Hmm. If action doesn't arise from a quiet center, then the action uh, has excessive strain to it, it has excessive attachment, and it's based on the same premises that it might be uh, act acting against. All right. So then bring me to what does it mean, you know, with the title of your book of being this activist of the Tao? <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> yeah. You know, for a long time, I loved just the quietest element of it because uh, I believe that life uh, if we let it, lives itself through happiness and sadness and gain and loss. But over the last uh, five or six years, I realized that inherent in every chapter of Lao Tzu's little book was this revolutionary uh, principles that would stand, kind of stand society on its, on its head if they were actually lived out. And I realized that in my love of his quietism, I had kind of neglected the idea that he espoused that out of this quiet center, very uh, energetic action can arise and, in fact, should arise. And I hadn't paid much attention to that. And I realized that, that my life needed to be a balance of activism and quietism, that there's a very important activism that grows out of quietism, but that the activism without the quietism uh, gets to spinning its wheels and leads really to, to frustration and <clears throat> anger and disappointment and despair. Which, so I wrote the book, Hope for, for Myself and for anybody else who struggles with uh, trying to be, do something uh, to help in, in today's world that needs, needs so much healing. How do how do I avoid the the despair? Uh, many years ago, maybe thirty years ago, I was very much a a, a political activist and uh, burned out. Uh, just got real discouraged and backed away from it. Now I'm ready to go back to it in a, a little bit different way. Uh, where it's not so much my agenda and not my trying to get people to do it right, by golly, but just do what's naturally arising for me and trust that it will contribute its own energy to uh, the revolution that we actually need in, in our culture. Now, with your your background in being a family counselor, and you know, I know that that's not what you're doing now, but mm -hmm. can, can you... Maybe 
give an example of how it could be applied in real life. So maybe an example of a family or people that come to you for counseling. And if you were that therapist now, how would, and maybe you did it back then too, but how would you apply these principles to people that are struggling with real life, everyday situations of the hustle and bustle of work, career, money, children, family, and, um, you know, what, what would be something that you would offer to them that maybe they could take from this to bring more peace, more love, more quiet to their life? Uh, yeah. As I talk to people today, and, and I would do it a little bit differently if I were to go back to my career as a therapist, um, then it was kind of helping people adapt to what we call the realities of life. Um, Today, I'm not so sure that what we call the realities are the realities, the struggles and, and the, the efforts and the little bit of success and failure and ambition and trying to get wealthy. And I think today I would try to help people understand uh, that perhaps the happiest life is one that gets simpler and simpler. Uh, Lao Tzu is a great believer in simplicity. I would try to help people understand that maybe, maybe their stress is is to a great degree self-imposed. I'd help people try to figure out what do they really want, what does life really mean for them. Um, I'd help them look at the Buddhist idea of right livelihood and how much is enough, because so much stress comes from buying the cultural ideas that. There's never enough. Mm. I try to help people understand that perhaps uh, happiness is a given in life and the pursuit of happiness is an illusion. That, that uh, success and failure are both illusions and that stopping and breathing and looking around and paying attention to the ordinary, just very simple elements of touch and taste and sight and sound um, might be enough. I no longer try to help people adapt to the rat race. Uh, I'd honestly tell them, get out of the rat race. And then they'd say to me, well, you got to be realistic. <laughs> and I'd say, okay, what's really real? And I'm looking out my window now at some pine trees and the rain and I'm smelling something cooking in the kitchen. And this is real. This is real. Our conditioned ideas of what is real is perhaps illusion. I wouldn't try to argue anybody. Uh, Lao Tzu said that arguments is pretty much useless. But I'd really ask lots of questions about what do you really want? What, what, how much money do you need? What do you, what do you, how do you really want to eat and live? And where do you want to live? And what do you really want to do? Uh, what, what would you do if you didn't have to talk about what our society calls earning a living? Well, golly, people say, I'd do this. And then they inevitably say, but, and then comes, where I'd try to work with them. Okay, let's look at the but and see if it really, what's really hindering us from, from living the life that deep, deep down inside we know we want to live with love for our family and peace in our world. And we, also, we all know that it doesn't take much to have a, a comfortable life. Uh, we don't have to earn nearly as much as we think we do. And I would agree with you. I was um, I was laughing because I was going to say probably what the counter argument of that would be, where people would probably come to you and say, yeah, you have to be a realist, but I have this family, and I'm in this job right now, and there are true uh-huh. bills that I have to pay, and, mm-hmm. you know, how do I just quit everything and, and live this happy life? So for people <laughs> maybe – who really are kind of in the nine to five job and yeah. you know, they have all of these expenses and bills. 
what would you say or what would you recommend being the first thing that people start to do, maybe to take that first step of actually realizing that maybe they can step out of that rat race and maybe in a year or two or a five-year plan, maybe it even could be quicker than that, that maybe they could find themselves out of the working world and really living a life when you ask that question, what do you want to be doing and make that come true? Yeah, you know, sort of piously self-righteous with people of, you know, oh, come on, come on, get a grip and get out of, get off the rat race because I know how hard it is and I I still struggle. Uh, Like I say, my dad would still be waiting for me to get a real job and and that's a deep part inside of me of, of, you know, gosh, I should, you know, I'm, I don't have all the things that a person's supposed to have for their security. Maybe I'd better, and so on. Then I think that I'd say that don't wait until that happens to take a deep breath and understand that you might be happy right now. Uh, You're commuting. You're going to a 9-to-5 job. You've got bills to pay. But you also have people who love you. you. In the midst of all this, you have tastes and touches and sounds and sights that please you. Uh, Come to the present moment, even if you're on the freeway commuting, come to the moment of just looking around. And instead of making a judgment about how fast they're going or how slow they're going or how I wish I wasn't doing this, just say, this is what I'm doing right now. And I have a choice of either to be sink down into the natural contentment of this is my life right now or I can constantly be telling myself how much I hate this and how much I wish I was doing something else and Bill's full of it and et cetera and et cetera. And in fact, everybody is just living their life in the present moment and there are lots of things in the present moment that are wondrous. Uh, The color blue, a red flower, the rain, the look on the face of the woman in the car next to me, I wonder what it is, I wonder what she's feeling and thinking. Uh, Maybe I'm more connected to her than I thought I was. Uh, When I get to the office, there's going to be some coffee. I'm going to sit and I'm going to have a sip of that coffee for a few minutes before before I jump into work. Just all the little simple things that a person can do that step by step create the kind of climate in which they may be able to see and make these, maybe make these bigger changes. The changes in uh, where I live and what I do and how I eat and uh, how I relate to my family come out of the indescribable little moment by moment personal changes of waking up to the world. Yeah, I think that's a nice first step. Now, you and your wife live pretty minimally as well. I think I was reading a little bit of a description where you really yourself gave away a lot of your belongings or you live with very little things. And and you had just said earlier that we really don't, we can live very simply. There isn't a lot that we need. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I wish I, I you know, I wish I could say we live very minimally, but I look around, I sometimes think, gosh, this is this is wonderfully comfortable. But, you know, I don't think there's a, a way of describing how much you should or shouldn't have. It's a, it's a question each person needs to ask for themselves. But the, the, the question is really asking it of yourself rather than then asking the, you end up asking the question, well, how much should I have? And how much do I need? And, and the question really is, really deep down inside, what do I, what do I want? And I want good things to eat. I, I, want, I want people to touch me in love. I, I, I want uh, to be warm. Uh, or, or cool. I, I want to have some kind of beauty, however you describe it, in my life. And how much, and how do I go, I go about having that? And my culture says that what I want is the next new thing. My computer goes out of date about every six months. And I'm supposed to upgrade it, and I upgrade it and find it doesn't work anymore, so I have to 
buying a new computer and you know that that rat race of distraction and multitasking and getting and I get all these I want all these things because I need the distraction and then I wake up to you know I want a comfortable place to sit I want to do work that I love I want some some good healthy I want to eat healthy in an appropriate way that benefits the planet and I want to be loved and to love and all the rest is is really crap it's something I'm told that I need and it you know we live in one of the most distracted unhappy societies uh, ever and me too you know I, I get distracted all the time with well thankfully we live in a place now where we can't get internet at the house the the trees block the satellite dish and there's no cell phone signal there's just kind of a barely a cell phone signal I have to do some work on the internet but I have to go into town to do it which means it has to be work rather than distraction I can't mm. sit down in the evening and open up and and surf the web uh, I have to do it mindfully and with some sense of okay I've got to go into town now and, and this is the work I have to do well I'm kind of babbling on about my life uh, but I just both both Nancy and I realized that we want we want to be contributing and we want to be doing it gently and at the same time mindfully Nancy's a, a traditional bookbinder and book restorer she has a studio here in in the house she repairs old books and does conservation work on old books and and mostly right now she's binding editions of new books in handbound uh, you know, long-lasting, well-done, traditional book binding. And it's interesting that people are getting more and more interested in those kind of traditional crafts that have some sense of mindfulness and attention and and slowness uh, built into them. I don't know. I don't know what. I don't know what. You know, I don't know what people need to do. A particular individual. I just know the questions that people need to ask themselves. And what would you say are the top three things that our listeners can do to start what you reference to be a quiet revolution? Uh, it's going to be it's it's going to be different uh, for everybody. But first, the first thing I would urge people to do is to, in whatever path and 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 way is appropriate to you, find a deep connection to the natural world, whether it's in the city or or in the country, a deep connection to that which is tangible and uh, brings you a sense of community. I think a revolution begins from the understanding that there's just one thing happening here and we're all part of it. Um, That is... Then the second thing I'd do is, is to have people let go of their anger. Most of the activists I know get into activism because of their outrage at a particular situation. I think that's appropriate. That's how, that's how I got, got into it. And that's how I, I still have outrage at particular situations. But action that grows out of outrage is always minimum minimalized by the resistance to it. Um, Let the anger settle down. And when you think of the next thing to do, let it arise naturally. Let it be a very small step. If you try to change governments and institutions, you may satisfy your anger. You may burn off some of your energy. But it's seldom going to work and because you're you're confronting governments and institutions with the anger you end up replacing them with something that's built on the same assumptions look deeply at your assumptions of what you need like like Gandhi Gandhi was able to to be very effective in in uh, India's independence revolution because he touched a deep deep understanding in the Hindu population of simplicity 
and uh, community. It's harder in our society because we don't have that deep, common understanding of, of a simple life. We can't use a spinning wheel as a, as a symbol of, of, our, of our revolution. We'll have to find something that gets us each deeply touching something simple. Maybe change what you eat. Maybe have a carless day. And a lot of my active friends say these, these kind of little simple things aren't enough. I agree that they're not enough, but they're an essential beginning. If we try to build on just our outrage and our idea of the way we think things should be, we'll burn ourselves out and we'll be ineffective. But if we begin to build step by step on the little changes in our own life, we'll have the kind of revolution that that, that Gandhi had, although his, you know, look at India today, we need, a, we need to keep going with that kind of revolution. So one of Lao Tzu's famous verses is the step of a, the journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. So my advice to people is, what today? What step shall I take now? When I finish listening to this, this broadcast, I have probably a dozen options as to what I'm going to do. Will I do... Will I just thoughtlessly do something, or will I stop for a minute and say, what's next, and what's the most authentic thing for me to do? In this little moment, shall I go to the web and start surfing? Shall I pick up a book? Shall I step outside? Shall I just sit for a minute? Shall I call a friend? Those are the little steps that that take us to a revolution. Uh, they really do. And what are some other take-homes for people um, or maybe reasons why they would want to pick up your book? Maybe they're going to decide, I am going to search the web and I'm going to go on Amazon and I'm going <laughs> to buy this guy's book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you're going to search the web, go ahead, go to Amazon and buy the book, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, here, there's a guy yeah. criticizing the web and, you know, it's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, he's going to have to go on the web tomorrow and, you know, put up a piece on his blog, but, you know, continue to use words to try to to describe that which words can't do. Anyway, yeah, uh, another take-home uh, I, 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 I would hope would be, uh, especially for the activist, would be um, don't be discouraged. Uh, we'll not, we won't see the fruits of, of the kind of revolution or transformation we long for. Our children may not see it. We may be part of a long, long transformation. But don't be discouraged. Your, our desire for a world of peace and harmony and contentment is real. And the movement of the Tao, the energy of the universe, is always on that yin-yang wheel of bringing balance to, to the universe. And in our particular society, we understand we're way out of balance, and there's a wave on the front cover of the new, of my book, and that wave is the symbol that the energy of the revolution of the the flow of the Tao, the the mystery of the universe, is moving, and we don't have to initiate it. We don't have to accomplish our agendas. We have to just keep taking the next steps and not be discouraged and not be attached to outcomes and let, let an essential contentment underlie the discontent that we feel in life. In other words, we're discontented with a particular system or institution, but let that discontent float easily on top of a fundamental underlying contentment that this is the life I have to live this is where I am today, and this is fine. I'll just take the next step that I want to take, and I'll be sad or I'll be happy, but underneath it all, I'm fine. I'm here to do what it is mine to do. I don't have to succeed in any worldly definition. I just have to keep 
taking the next step along this thousand mile journey and relax into it. Uh, let go of the anger. Uh, <laughs> turn off the television as much as you can during the political season. Uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a hard few months <laughs> for, 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 for all of us. Uh, uh, relax, relax into it. Uh, we're part of something much, much bigger than we can understand or that we can even describe. Uh, <laughs> Bobby McFerrin, you know, don't worry, be happy. Be happy, yeah. <laughs> and, at, at, and at the same time, when we don't worry and are happy, incredible energy, that's the paradox. When we don't worry, rest on our fundamental contentment. Incredible energy is freed that arises naturally in the human spirit and manifests itself in all sorts of effective action, uh, transforming the way we eat and live and schools and, you know, everybody's got their own interest. But when it grows out of that deep, don't worry, be happy, it's profoundly effective. Uh, so rest into that paradox. Don't believe the old saw of, well, if you're not upset all the time, you're not going to change anything. Nuts. If you're upset all the time, you're not going to change anything. True change arises from, from people who are fundamentally at peace with themselves and who don't resist the natural flow of what to do next. You know, I, haven't, I haven't preached in a long time. Thanks for the soapbox. <laughs> I, I sometimes kind of, you know, sometimes I get on my soapbox. Yeah, but that was great. Well, it was so nice speaking with you today, Bill. Really appreciate you taking the time. And um, would you like to let people know that do have Internet access where they can find you, what your website is? <laughs> yes, <laughs> if you must go out to the web, uh, my website is... Uh, Taoist, T-A-O-I-S-T, living, TaoistLiving.com, T-A-O-I-S-T, yeah. And all of your books on there. You have a ton of books on yeah. there. And um, are people able to purchase the books from your website, or does it take them right to the no, Amazon it takes, store? It, it, takes, it takes them to the, to the option of Amazon, Barnes & Noble, or IndieBound which okay. is a reference to their local bookstore. And you can get it at, you can get them at your local bookstore too. Which I would Wonderful. like to, I would like to have you do. You know, yeah. If, if you've got a local bookstore that, that you'd like to support, go go get it from them. Well, maybe this will be your bestseller. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> you never uh, know. You know. I you just you just never know. I don't I don't think about that much. I Yeah. Sometimes I, I, you know, I make about from the the modest royalties that come in from my books and Nancy's uh, craft. We make about what four fifths of an income, <laughs> and the other fifth we just never know, you know. And you know that's fine. No, it, we we manage to get we we manage to have a very very happy life. Right. Well, and the most important thing too is that. You know, what I heard you say in the beginning was this is the book that you wanted to write. This is this the book is the one I wanted that, to write. Yeah. Right. This, this, so this. that that's what's important. You did it. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> All right, Bill. Well, thanks so much. It was a pleasure and lots oh, of luck pleasure. with uh, the book here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And, okay. and uh, uh, lots of luck with, with your work as well. Thanks, Bill. Bye. If you'd like more information about our films or to purchase our DVDs, you can head on over to our website at thepastseries.com. They're also available to purchase on amazon.com. Our films are also streaming online at vimeo.com, guyamtv.com, and iTunes. If you have a show suggestion or would like us to interview someone specifically, please feel free to shoot us an email at info at thepastseries.com or send us a tweet at thepastseries. Please rate and review us in iTunes and subscribe. We hope you enjoyed the show.